The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's nice to have you join me today. I'm Dr. Roseanne Schaff, um, and I am an occupational therapist and a neuroscientist. I've devoted my career to the study of sensory features in those with neurodevelopmental disorders, and in particular, autism. As an occupational therapist, I always have my eye on assisting children and families to lead independent and fulfilling lives. Today, I'll present information to you about the sensory features of autism and about the intervention work that we have been doing to address these. So first, a little bit about autism. Autism spectrum disorder is a very prevalent neurodevelopmental disorder, the most common one of childhood, and now affecting one in 54 children uh, born today. And autism includes a wide range or a spectrum of symptoms, skills, levels, and abilities and disabilities. And as you know, some people are mildly impaired while others are severely disabled. And further, many individuals with autism are diverse in, ter in, ter in terms of what we call phenotypic or characteristic diversity, meaning that their symptoms vary greatly. Um, and we'll see this is the case as well with their sensory features. I put a link there to the National Institute of Mental Health um, website about autism if you want to learn a little bit more. And also, any of the links that I have in today's presentation are provided on the handout that you get, you got with this presentation so that you can click on them at your leisure and uh, get more information. So as a neurodevelopmental disorder, what that means is that there are differences in the way the brain and the nervous system process and integrate information both at the neuronal and synaptic level and at the brain level. This results in individuals with autism sensing the world in different ways. Because after all, the way we bring information into our brain is through the sensory systems. And this is one of the reasons that they're so important. Now, what are the senses? I'm sure you're all familiar with what I call the big five. And, oops, sorry, I got a little notice going back. The big five, vision, auditory, olfactory or smell, taste, and touch. But you may be surprised to know there's more than five sensory systems. Here, I've represented some of the unconscious senses, such as proprioception, which gives us information about the body, muscles, joints, and tendons. You can see this funny picture of the elephant balancing on this ball. You can imagine that they need to have a good awareness of their body through their proprioceptors in order to do this. There's also the vestibular system represented on the right by the skier. This system gives us information about where our head is and it helps us to stay balanced and upright or to turn upside down as is the case in this skier. In addition, we have interoception or senses that come from inside your body, like temperature, pain, and in what we call interoception. Interoception comes from our organs, the, sens the sensations we get from our organs, such as our bladder. For example, when your bladder is full, the sensory receptors on the bladder detect it and they trigger a motor response for you to avoid. This is a sensory motor response that depends on adequate sensory integration. Now you may know that sensory features are now part of the diagnostic criteria for autism in the DSM-5. And just to review the criteria for autism, now there's two main criteria, persistent deficits in social communication and interaction across contexts and then restrictive and repetitive patterns of behaviors, interests, and activities. 
And as part of, uh, as one of the four qualifiers of this restrictive and repetitive patterns criteria, you can see in red there, I have the sensory features, hypo or hyperreactivity to sensory input or unusual interest in the sensory aspects of the environment. Because sensory features are now part of the diagnostic criteria, this has created increased interest in these sensory features, what they are, how they function in individuals with autism, and how can we address them. I'll also say that in addition to hypo, hyperreactivity, and unusual interest, there is also difficulties in sensory perception and sensory integration in persons with autism, and we'll talk about them throughout the talk briefly. So sensory experiences provide an important foundation for development. And here you see children using their sensory systems and um, to, to act and interact with the environment and with others in physical, social, and language activities. And then they also contribute to social emotional development, self-regulated behavior, and functional skills. So you can see that they provide an important foundation for many skills and behaviors. Now, what about the sensory features in autism? Well, they include, as we said, hypo and hyperreactivity to sensory input, which means adverse responses to specific sounds, textures, taste, etc. These unusual interest and apparent indifference to stimuli such as pain and temperature. Also, poor sensory integration, which is the binding together of two or more sensations. For example, when you put together visual and auditory sensations, like you're doing now as you're listening to this talk, but perhaps always also looking at my face, you're putting those sensations together to help you interpret the words that I'm speaking. So why study sensory features? in autism, well, they impact everyday life, both children and families, as you'll see shortly. And parents tell us that sensory features are very important in their life and they seek services to address them because they interfere with their daily life activities. Now, at the Jefferson Autism Center of Excellence, we conduct research from neuroscience to intervention research. The neuroscience research focuses on characterizing sensory features physiologically and also looking at different genetic groups. And um, we also look at how they impact everyday life. Today, I'm going to focus on our intervention studies where we have studied, identified and studied interventions for sensory features uh, in persons with autism. I'll just show you a little bit about these physi physiological studies and you're welcome to go to our website and learn more about them. Um, but here you can see on the left, some of our research that has looked at autonomic nervous system functions, where we found that it's different in children with autism and sensory systems, whereby their parasympathetic system isn't working to help regulate uh, the responses to sensation and their sympathetic system on the bottom left is working over time. We also found when we were comparing sensory features in a group of children with XYY syndrome to typical kids and to those with ASD, that the sensory features actually may be a distinguishing and identifying feature of autism spectrum disorder. And we've published this work in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders and it's readily accessible to you. We also found that sensory features are important because they impact families' abilities to function and participate both inside and outside their home. In these studies, we did uh, is qualitative research where we interviewed and spoke with families about how sensory behaviors impact their routines. And we found that sensory difficulties do impact their everyday life. And I put some quotes in here of parents telling us how uh, food sensitivities make the mornings very hard for them, or going away on vacation or visiting family by flying. This family said their last commercial flying experience, they both swore off it, never again. The noise, the newness, he was just inconsolable. 
And then many families tell us that they can't attend their other children's events, such as basketball games, because the child with autism is so overwhelmed by the noise and the touches of the people in the outside environments. So we published this research also in the journal Autism, and uh, you can, I have this source there. Now on to uh, the intervention for sensory features, underscoring the, um, the impact of sensory features, parents report that occupational therapy using the principles of air sensory integration is, the among, is among the most requested service by parents of children with autism, which underscores its importance, and also that it is rated, occupational therapy is rated as the number one service that helped their child with autism. So clearly, this is important to families. The intervention that occupational therapists do, we call it air sensory, occupational therapy using the principles of air sensory integration, involves sophisticated assessment and clinical reasoning to design and implement interventions. And you can see here in this slide, the active ingredients in the intervention are that they're active, individually tailored sensory motor activities contextualized in play at the just right challenge to promote participation in life activities and tasks. This intervention is primarily utilized in occupational therapy, but not exclusively. This intervention, air sensory integration, is both an art and a science. The science part is about using the knowledge that enriched experiences can promote integration and organization of the nervous system and brain via what we call neuroplasticity. That is that the brain and nervous system can change in response to the experiences that it has. So the intervention is enriched sensory motor experiences contextualized in play, and this provides the milieu, if you will, for neuroplasticity in children. The art of therapy is in the therapist creating a playful therapeutic environment designed to engage the child in needed experiences to promote their function and participation. As you can see there, a little picture of it on the right. <clears throat> It looks like a lot of fun, like you see on the left. And in fact, it is a lot of fun. But while we're doing this intervention, we're actually thinking about well, what's the data that we got from the assessment? What are the families telling us are the challenges they're having with the child? What's going on in this child's brain and nervous system? And then we create experiences for them. We call them individually tailored experiences to target the sensory factors that are impacting their ability to do this down in the right hand, uh, the bottom right of your screen, participate and interact. That's the ultimate goal and outcome of occupational therapy using air sensory integration. Now, I spoke previously about these active ingredients. Oh, my slides seem to be jumping. Here you go. And so any intervention that's studied, you must distinguish it from other interventions. So you must identify the active ingredients, which are active, individually tailored, sensory motor activities, contextualizing play, at the just right challenge to promote function and participation. So be careful when you're reading about or choosing interventions for your child with autism or to study for those of you who are scientists. Air sensory integration is the evidence-based approach. It is complex and requires advanced training. It's not a simple intervention, some of the, such as some of these other sensory interventions, such as brushing or spinning in a board, on a board. It is complex, individually tailored, and it is based on assessment data from that child. As I said, occupational therapy using air sensory integration is a complex intervention. It requires the integration of knowledge about the child, knowledge about their strengths and challenges, and knowledge about the intervention itself. This graphic, these gears, represent the complexity of the intervention, showing the active ingredients are put together in unique ways for each child. We've published about the active ingredients in air sensory integration, 
and developed a measure called the Air Sensory Integration Fidelity to Treatment Measure so that in our studies, we can measure whether the intervention was in fact true to these identified principles. There are published studies that call themselves sensory integration, but they do not adhere to these tested and evidence-based principles. So I wanted to call your attention to them as well. We also operationalize the intervention using an approach we call data-driven decision-making. It's systematic and it can be easily replicated. It's a series of steps that the therapist goes through with their clinical reasoning as they're gathering data, using the data, and de designing treatment and measuring outcomes. We published this um, approach in a replicatable map protocol, which is important for validation in science so that others can replicate the intervention as well. So this book here, I put the link to this on your handout, describes the intervention and the approach that we use, it, use and operationalizes the active ingredients. We've also published about the development of the manualized protocol in the literature. So once we had the intervention all set, we were ready to test whether the intervention worked and whether it was effective with children with autism. So we conducted a series of studies, starting with a feasibility trial to determine if it was safe, acceptable to parents, and if the therapists were able to implement the treatment with good fidelity. And in fact, we found that they were, and this is published in the journal Autism. Then we conducted a randomized control trial, a pilot study really, funded by the Autism Speaks Foundation, which is published in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders. And this study actually had a big impact on the field because it shifted, or I, I should say it was the thing that tilted this intervention, the tipping point where this intervention then became accepted as an evidence-based intervention. So I'll show you a little bit about the findings from that, where we compared the children in the control group to the treatment group using uh, goal attainment scaling on parent identified goals. And we found that there was a significant increase in goal attainment in the children who received occupational therapy using air sensory integration with a fairly strong effect size of 1.2, showing that the findings were substantial. And then we triangulated this data with another outcome measure called the Pediatric Evaluation of Disabilities Inventory. And at the bottom of this chart, chart in red, you can see that parents rated their children as being much more independent in self-care and socialization as a result of the intervention, uh, highly significant at, with strong effect sizes of 0.9 and 0.7. So we feel very uh, confident from the results of this study that we had some good results showing the impact of occupational therapy using air sensory integration. And as I said, this resulted in air sensory integration being an evidence, meeting the criteria for evidence-based treatment in a couple of different publications, the Council for Exceptional Children's Guidelines for Evidence-Based Practices, which you see here, but also just recently in the Frank Porter Graham Center's uh, listing of evidence-based practices for children and youth and young adults with autism. It's now also considered evidence-based. <clears throat> which is really huge uh, and a big boost for getting this intervention covered by insurance companies as well. Now we're involved in a comparative effectiveness trial that's funded by the National Institute of Health that's comparing occupational therapy using air sensory integration to behavioral interventions in a large cohort of children with autism. We're working with our partners at the Albert Einstein Medical Center in the Bronx, New York, and I've listed some of my partners there. One of the unique features of this study is that in addition to looking at the functional outcomes of the intervention, we're also studying neuroplasticity. Does the brain's ability to process and integrate sensory information change? So under the guidance of Dr. Sophie Mulholm and Dr. John Fox, we are measuring multisensory integration via EEG 
to see, in fact, if children with autism are integrating sensations in real time simultaneously better after the intervention. And if so, this will further validate the theoretical rationale of air sensory integration. We're finishing that study now, so I, we have about another year of data collection to go, and then we'll be able to look at our results, analyze them, and publish them. Here's a paper by uh, some of the multisensory integration researchers, including Dr. Fox and Mulholm, that talks about multisensory integration in children with autism. We're also funded by the Nancy Laurie Marks Foundation to uh, conduct what's called a program project grant, which is a large grant with several smaller projects under it. So these five projects are all funded around one theme, which is sensory functions in autism. And we're looking at sensory functions from the neuron all the way into the, all the way up to the intervention. So we're spanning basic science research to intervention research. It's our hopes that these five projects will expand our knowledge about sensory features in autism and the service project that we are doing that will train, that is training occupational therapists and ophthalmology residents with the skills needed to assess those with autism, providing vision assessments, as well as assessments of other sensory functions provided by the occupational therapist. So you can see here in this slide, we have a listing of the five different projects and some of the persons that are working on them. And then the pictures are showing you my colleague, Dr. Alex Levin, who partners with me on the vision part of this project to develop training modules for uh, really medical professionals so that they know how to, they understand persons with autism and that they can get some skills in interacting with them during vision exams and other exams to improve their success. We hope these training modules are gonna be available uh, internationally soon. We're just launching our first training uh, next week, September, in, next month in September to the ophthalmology residents at Jefferson. We also are fortunate in Philadelphia that our football team feels very close and aligned with autism. And so they develop the Eagles Autism Foundation, and they fund it through the Eagles Autism Challenge, which is a uh, event that includes uh, a run, a bike, and a walk, as well as many activities on the day of at the Lincoln Financial Field with the Eagles players. Uh, we are fortunate to have funding from this uh, foundation, as I'll show you in a minute, but I also wanted to just show this picture of my husband and I getting ready for the bike ride last year, or two years ago rather, with the MVP quarterback winning, the winning Super Bowl quarterback, Nick Foles, who was there at the event as well. And we're funded by the Eagles uh, Autism Foundation to develop and test a new measure of sensory functions for um, children. And specifically with this funding, we're gonna use it on children with autism and get normative data. It's called the Evaluation of Air Sensory Integration and Dr. Zoe Mayo and the others listed there are my collaborators. And we have a huge effort around this, um, this assessment. We have normative data collectors from over 110 countries all over the world. Here's some of them. Here we are on the top of uh, Lion's Head Mountain in South Africa uh, at a conference that we were at uh, two years ago. Seems like a lifetime ago at sunrise. So I somehow convinced them all to get up early and climb up to see the sunrise, which we did. A little bit about our Jefferson Autism Center of Excellence. You can see here that it's dedicated to research, education and training, community outreach, and clinical services. And through our Jefferson Autism Center, we have a number of training opportunities that are available, including an advanced practice certificate in autism for professionals who wanna learn more about autism assessment, treatment, the neuroscience behind autism, and then translating that knowledge into practice and research. 
There are trainings available in the administration of the assessments and the intervention in air sensory integration available through uh, the organization called CLASI, Collaborative Leadership in Air Sensory Integration. And I also provided those links for you as well. Caught off the presses, we just finished an online education module that trains individuals in data-driven decision-making, this clinical reasoning process that I talked to you about previously that has been the undergird for all of our intervention studies. It's the systematic approach that uses data to characterize individuals with autism's sensory features and then create interventions based on them and measure the outcomes of them using data-based um, outcome measures. So I'll just end by saying, in summary, the goal of this presentation was to make you aware of the sensory features in autism and their impact on participation in life tasks and activities, as well as their impact on development and behavior. I also wanted to inform you of the research in the field of sensory features in autism, and in particular, the intervention research that's being conducted by our team and the Jefferson Autism Center of Excellence. We're at the forefront of research on sensory features in autism, and I hope you became aware of the evidence-based intervention, occupational therapy using air sensory integration, and can differentiate it from other sensory interventions that may not have strong evidence or data to support their effectiveness. Again, rather than provide you with a handout, I provided you with links to these websites and resources, including training links and links uh, to my bio so that you can find some of the articles and references that I spoke about. I encourage you to become aware of the evidence-based interventions and be wary of those that make inflated claims. For example, I know one is out there now, it came across my Instagram feed as a way to cure autism by putting your child in a hammock and spinning them around for a period of time every day. There's no magic cure. And I think you can appreciate now that intervention uh, is, is complex and requires uh, a strong base of knowledge and clinical reasoning. I hope that as parents, if you're seeking this kind of intervention uh, during this time of COVID, the pandemic, you can talk with your therapist about strategies to manage your child's sensory needs at home and create environments that will facilitate their sensory motor development. Perhaps you can even participate in research if you're able. I know that we are just getting our research programs back up and going. Uh, we're following CDC guidelines and using personal protective equipment. So I put on this slide and on your handout some ways that you can participate in research uh, by contacting some of the research coordinators located at our various sites. We have some research going on at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Uh, contact either Rachel or Khadija at Children's Specialized Hospital in New Jersey. Contact Joanne Hunt or Regina Friedman and at the Rose F. Kennedy's Children Evaluation and Rehabilitation Center at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx, New York, and you can um, contact Liz Ridgway for that as well. So I, I thank you very much, and I also put my information there as well. So I'll stop there, and I'll, um, I'll open the control panel, and I'll see if uh, there are questions in the chat box or if Denise has any has gotten any questions that you'd like to convey. Yes, there are quite a few in the chat box. So if you look in that section, you should see them there, but prompt me back if you don't. Um, I just see things like I cannot hear. That is the question section. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right, let me go to chat. Let me see if I can find that. Hmm. No, I'm not seeing them, Denise. So if you can help me out. Sure. Uh, if you go back to that question section, if you scroll down um, after the initial people who had a few audio issues connecting, you, you'll see there's some questions from parents and- Oh, providers. I'm getting there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Let me just go up so I'll make sure I'm not missing any. Oh yeah, I see a lot there, okay. Is there any, any certification? Okay, I'm gonna go past that one to the next one. Can we ask questions? Yes, there's a question. Good afternoon. Are there any books that you recommend for parents that we can use to help our children with different types of input and activities that correlate with the needed types of input? Um, so there are a couple books written for specifically for parents. Uh, one is by Lucy Miller, and it's called Sensational Kids, and that's a good parent guide. Another one is by Carol Kranowitz, and it's called The Sensational Child. That's another one that parents find very useful. Um, they're the two I would recommend for parents. Uh, if you're a therapist, we have a book, let me see, I think I have it right here, coincidentally, um, that I showed you on the slide as well. This will be a good, a good book for you. And a previous book that we authored, uh, myself and Suzanne Smith Rowley, has a whole chapter on sensational ways to play with your child. And so uh, I can provide the reference for that um, later uh, to Denise. So there's some, some suggestions for you. During COVID, what might families do when we don't have equipment? Well, during COVID, it's tough. So I would encourage all families that feel that they have a child uh, that can benefit from this kind of therapy to contact your school district or, and or contact your insurance company to try to get occupational therapy uh, services for your child. The occupational therapists are delivering this intervention uh, via teletherapy as they can. I even have colleagues who um, go to the family's house, drop off uh, some equipment to them that the school district has purchased, and then they coach the parents uh, via, over, via telehealth on activities to do with their child. There's no one activity that I can tell you to do for every child, because I think you can appreciate from the presentation that everything is individually tailored. All children are different. Every children will have different needs. So it's really important that you work with a professional who's been trained in this area to help identify and monitor the activities for your child. So again, I would encourage you to reach out to your school district because it is a related service that, that should be covered. And if not, to check with your insurance company. I know that some states like my state, Pennsylvania, has passed the Autism Act, which uh, mandates that every family with autism gets a certain amount of, of uh, insurance coverage uh, to provide services for their children with autism. I will tell you this, we do know, what well, one thing that we know about uh, autism is the earlier uh, the intervention and the more intensive the intervention, generally speaking, the better the outcome. So I would encourage you as parents to advocate for your child and, and get these services, uh, even in this time of the pandemic. The next question is, would the same intervention be used for older children? I have two children who weren't diagnosed until they were eight and 12, and I have not been able to access services for them despite their sensory differences. Would occupational therapy still be appropriate and beneficial for them? So I'm gonna say yes. To that question. Um, we know that the brain remains plastic throughout our lifetime and so occupational therapy using air sensory integration could still benefit your child. Of course the activities would be tailored to their age and their size but I will also say that a part of occupational therapy using air sensory integration is adaptations to the environment and the routines. So the occupational therapist will be able to look at your you and your child's daily life activities and recommend adaptations or alterations to your environment or to your daily routines to help facilitate that child's function and participation. As the child gets older, we lean less on remedial therapies that are meant to change the behaviors and improve them. I don't want to say change behaviors. I want to say improve them via, and we work more toward 
helping that child function in the environment that they have or more toward adaptations. That's just a general rule of thumb. But if you get in touch with an occupational therapist, they will be able to help you with that. Great question. Um, okay, that's that question. Uh, how can families find providers using AIRS occupational therapy approach? Is there a registry or a regulatory body? Yes, thank you for that question. The CLASI, the Collaborative Leadership in AIRS Sensory Integration, now holds a registry of therapists that have been trained in this approach uh, with their contact information. So I would utilize that link. I think it's www.classy.org to get to that registry. And if you're having trouble, feel, please feel free to reach out to me at, by email and I will link you with the appropriate person who can give you that information. Is there a way you can share the articles on your list? Hmm, I thought about that. I just didn't have time to gather them together. So I can send some of those key articles to Denise and if she wants to put them up on a website or something like that, that would be great. For any of those, for any of you who use LinkedIn, many of them are there. Nope, I think I hear Denise chiming in. I was gonna say too, um, we can easily add those to the website and people can also watch the playback and fast forward. They can fast forward through them and grab them there too. Yeah, but they're they're looking for the whole, oh, you mean the link to it, yeah. They're, uh, I will, if I send you the PDFs of some of the articles that are open access, can you make them available? I definitely can, yes. Okay, good, I'll do that then. Um, what is the range in autism severity of children in the study? I can imagine more severely impacted children might have difficulty with touch and the instruments needed to measure the brain activity. Oh, so true, whoever said that knows children with autism. Yeah, so um, we have children in the study um, one of our inclusion criteria is the IQ must be 65 or above. And that's because we have found that children with lower IQ are not able to complete our assessment process. It's really unfortunate that we have to leave out in these studies uh, kids that might be more involved, um, but you have to start somewhere. So we start, we, we made a choice to start with these studies uh, by using that IQ cutoff so that we can conduct the assessments because we really need the sophisticated uh, assessment data to be able to plan and tailor the intervention appropriately. We are hopeful that as we get good data from these studies that we're doing now, that we will be able to include children that are lower functioning and even push our assessment development down to children that are uh, more involved with lower IQ so that we can also include them and study them as well. I will say that we have, uh, we have relaxed the criteria for a few of the children who are more severe um, out of need for participants in our studies and um, they have done quite well. So uh, we don't get sometimes all of the assessment data from them, but we've been able to tailor the treatment based on the assessment data that we have. So, so we're working on that. That's a great question and thank you so much. And as, as far as the brain activity, the main thing with the children is that they need to be able to tolerate the EEG cap and then be able to sit and perform uh, the tasks, the multisensory integration tasks that we ask of them. And so we've um, designed, not myself, but my colleagues who do this have designed um, some social stories for the children that the parents can read for them ahead of time. And also they send home a mock EEG cap, sort of like a bathing cap that has some of the clip-on EEG um, leads to it so that the children can practice with it at home so that when they get to the lab, uh, it's not completely new for them. So yeah, we're trying. Um, do not download the PDF. Yeah, okay, I'll let Denise deal with that. Could my son's distractiveness be caused by sensory processing issues? He cannot concentrate on one thing for any length of time and positively seeks having two, three, four things going on at once, particularly noises. He has ASD diagnosis, though I'm not sure, 
and is visually impaired. Yeah, so you bring up a great point, which is this behavior of children um, wanting sensory input and engaging in activities to try and um, gain sensory input or a high level of activity. This is why an assessment is necessary because your son may have um, an attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity. He may have a sensory integration problem that is um, creating a need for him to get greater sensory input. And if the latter is the case, then this intervention that we talked about today, occupational therapy using air sensory integration, could be helpful for him. But the first step is to get the assessment. So I would contact um, your pediatrician or your, if there's a psychologist in the school and ask the psychologist if they can do an assessment and then also include an occupational therapy assessment. Many schools have occupational therapists either as contract or on their team, on their multidisciplinary evaluation team, so that you can evaluate whether or not it is a sensory integration problem. That is really the first step. It's just like I often say when I'm talking, you know, it's like if you go to your physician because you're sick and you say, oh my gosh, I have a sore throat. And the physician says, sore throat? Here, take these red pills without even assessing you. The chances of the red pills helping you are less because you didn't get a proper assessment. So it's sort of an analogy I'd like to make. Proper assessment is necessary before you can really decide whether the behavior that you're um, observing and that's impacting your child's ability to function and participate is sensory based or not but it's important to follow up on that and do that. Next question, can you discuss about primitive reflexes and how children sit like a frog position, not a W, but a frog position? How do you correct this? Thank you. Okay, well, I'm just gonna say in response to that question that um, the way I approach uh, children with autism and interventions is I don't focus in on um, something like improper sitting. The first thing I would say to the parent is, what's the challenge that your child's having? Is it sitting and attending during circle time in school? Is it being able to remain seated at the dinner table during dinner? Is it that his legs are um, uh, misshapen or, or not able to support him while he's walking during play or interactions? So I always step back and contextualize the issue within real life, daily life. I call that the participation challenge in the data-driven decision-making model. And then as you go through, if you find that the frog sitting or the W sitting is impacting that child's ability to participate in their everyday life, then you wanna figure out why that's happening. Is it because of primitive reflexes or is it because of some other feature? So, uh, I mean, many of us sit in different kinds of positions. Many children that are typically developing sit in W or what you're calling frog leg position. And it's not a problem in their everyday function and daily life. So I would suggest that rather than focusing on the sitting and the primitive reflexes that you focus on the child's ability to participate and engage and whether or not that's an issue. I know that the primitive reflex theory is, is an intervention is uh, in vogue right now. And there's a lot on the internet about it, but um, I'll just say that uh, I'm not a big proponent of it because it's addressing, it doesn't contextualize it within uh, everyday life and activities and function. Are there home-based therapies that can help with it can help with what are the home-based activities to work on in a reception? My child does bedwetting. Is it something that my OT can help with or is it more likely a medical issue? Okay, great question. And again, the first stop for this is your pediatrician to get an evaluation of your child. Now, I will say that if your child is having difficulty with bowel and bladder control, it is a sensory motor function. And if your child is having difficulty perceiving, processing, and integrating sensation, 
that this may be one area that it shows up and your occupational therapist can help. There is an occupational therapist, uh, her name is Isabel Biaudry, who is located in Spain, but hey, the world is small now with the internet, who specializes in this and works with a gastroenterologist, uh, Dr. Ramos, specifically for children who have these kinds of issues that have not been, um, have not responded to typical medical treatments, but have in fact responded to occupational therapy using a sensory integrative approach. So uh, her, her last name is spelled B-E-A-U-D-R-Y, and her first name is Isabel, and I'm sure you can find her by Googling her and uh, look at some of the research and data that she has as well. Um, a kind message shout out. So good to see awesome teacher. Thank you. Getting the word out about sensory integration. A fellow Jeff alumni. Woohoo! Nice to nice to have you here. Thank you. Are you aware of any specific strategies or adaptations that have been done that have been effective for OTs delivering care online? Well, it's a little soon to have um, outcome data or effectiveness data about teletherapy. But I will say that the American Occupational Therapy Association has uh, a lot of fact sheets and data about um, delivering therapy online. Um, and also, Classy, the organization that I told you about earlier, did a whole webinar, uh, yeah, a one hour webinar on using air sensory integration in telehealth that's available uh, for anybody who wants to watch it as well. So um, I would encourage you to use those two resources. I am an OTD with specialty in SI and ASD. Do you have visitors to the clinic? Yes, we take visitors to the clinic, but not now, not during COVID. So I would encourage you to reach out uh, to me after you know the COVID restrictions are, are lifted and uh, we can set something up, be great. I love uh, to have um, therapists that are interested in learning more and spread the word and hopefully, you know, uh, generate more and more research and information for parents, professionals, and researchers. Um, okay, I am Rosini from India, my child continuously spinning like a top. How might we determine? Oh, I know, I think you're going to know what I, I think you're going to know my answer, Rosini. How are you going to determine if it's sensory? You're going to get an assessment of his sensory ability to perceive, process, and integrate sensory information. And I will say that I'm a big advocate of more than just a sensory questionnaire. So, uh, you know, there are a couple of sensory questionnaires that are easily available. The sensory processing measure is one by its um, Western Psychological Services. You can find that online. The sensory profile is another. Both of the books that I mentioned uh, by Lucy Miller and Carol Kranowitz have sensory questionnaires in them. Uh, the sensory questionnaires are useful and helpful, but they only look at the behavior and they are not able to look at the potential mechanism or cause. And so I advocate using a questionnaire in combination with what we call a performance-based measure where a skilled um, evaluator is assessing the child's um, perception and integration and using a norm referenced rating scale to determine what the issues are. It's really the best way to determine if the child's spinning is related to a sensory issue or not so that you can um, seek the help that you need. So again, uh, in India, there are occupational therapists and there are some that are trained in sensory integration. If you go on the Classy website, I think you will be able to find some. What's the age range of the easy? The easy is going from three to 12 years of age. That's our first uh, version. And then once we get all the normative data and validity and reliability testing in place, we're gonna try to push it down and up so that it will be a wider age range as well. Uh, do you have any recommendations for parents collaborating with educating a pediatrician? How to start a discussion that appropriate 
adequately describes how the sensory issues may be a factor in addition to behavioral issues. Well, I'm going to say that um, uh, there was an article published in the journal Pediatrics in 2012 uh, that talked about sensory issues in children with developmental, just in children, and they advocated for assessment and occupational therapy as part of that. So I would suggest first that you maybe uh, call that pediatrician's attention to that article about, um, about the importance of sensory issues and adequate treatments for them. Next, I would suggest that you're, um, if you have an occupational therapist, that your pediatrician and occupational therapist collaborate, even in the form of the occupational therapist sending a short um, report to the pediatrician about the assessment findings. One thing that I found is that uh, when the therapist is able to clearly and articulately describe the data that they have in support of the child having a sensory issue and then link that to the participation challenges that the child is showing in their everyday life and then layer on top of that the evidence-based um, reports that are showing that addressing these are an effective intervention with persons with autism would be helpful. Now, of course, if you don't have an occupational therapist and your reason for educating the pediatrician is to get a referral to an occupational therapist, um, I th think it, it's gonna be useful for you to provide them with uh, some of these resources related to the evidence and perhaps even ask them to, to watch the webinar. I mean, it, it really is only a little bit over 20 minutes, the, the meat of the webinar that you just watched. So perhaps there'll be some strategies that will be helpful. Um, it's very common to have sensory issues with eating and swallowing. What are the current strategies for assessing and treating? Uh, might this be treated via telehealth? Yeah, well, so I'm so glad you said that because one of my uh, doctoral students just finished uh, a a program, it's called Meal Sense, capital M-E-A-L and then capital S-E-N-S-E, -S -E, where she developed a parent uh, education and training modules online for parents to uh, address their feeding issues that have a sensory component. If you want to um, reach out to me with your question, I will forward it on to her and let her reach out to you and perhaps she can share with you or you can even get enrolled in her clinic and participate in uh, telehealth using the MealSense program. And yes, feeding issues are, are very common in autism and uh, some of those feeding issues are related to sensory issues and this is exactly what the MealSense program is designed to address. Are exercises on a spinning board necessary? Yeah, for a child with vestibular processing issues. The last time my child threw up, exactly my reasoning for saying that these isolated sensory-based strategies like putting your kid in a net and spinning them or putting them on a board and spinning them, they are not uh, evidence-based. They may be harmful, as you saw with your child, that your child threw up and they're not based on sound data. So the first thing we do as an occupational therapist that we have a child who is showing um, a need or, or a vestibular, we would call it vestibular, the, the movement system based problem, is we do a thorough assessment. We identify whether it's per perception, hypo, hyperreactivity, or integration. And then we, um, we complete the assessment data and design an intervention with outcome measures to, to determine whether or not the intervention is helping the child. So that's exactly um, what we don't want parents to do is to see a behavior that they think is sensory related and I'll just say feed it by giving them more because that's not the solution for many children. So I, I wouldn't do that. 
Do you have any resources for potty training? Mm -hmm. I can tell my son. All right. So this whole thing about potty training, I would I reference to my colleague, Isabel Biodry. Um, and again, uh, if you can email me, I guess I'm going to get a flood of emails, but if you can email me, I'll, I'll, I'll link you with, with Isabel and uh, hopefully she can provide some guidance for you as well. Okay, let's see how we're doing. We have about five more minutes. We still have some questions. We're dealing with hypoactivity, hyper hyperactivity at home, particularly during COVID. Yes, I, I feel you. Are there specific exercises, activities that we might try at home? You mentioned you, uh, you mentioned books. Do you have tips specifically for these stressors? Well, again, it's hard to give blanket recommendations without knowing your child or uh, assessing your child. But I will say this, many children, many people benefit from active uh, in, engagement in movement activities that are, that are uh, I don't wanna say structured, but I wanna say that have, um, that have purpose to them. So, and that have resistance with them. We call them in OT, we call them heavy work activities, movement against resistance. So if you can find activities uh, for your child to engage in, not just, not just random movement, but movement activities for your child, um, like playing a game, as Simon says, playing a game of Twister, if they're able, um, going outside and pushing the baby, your, your younger child, if you have one in their, in their uh, stroller is an active resistive movement activity. Um, you know, bringing them to parks if they're open now where they can climb up ladders and rock walls and things of that nature are, are many times helpful for children who have a high activity level. It's that proprioception that they get that I talked about early in the presentation that seems to help regulate or um, regulate their, their need or their, I'll just say regulate their activity level. Again, really hard to make blanket statements, but maybe just a little tidbit of something that might help. Can you talk about toe walking? I wonder about what may be causing it. Is it sensory? Yep. Toe walking, hmm. it's been talked about since I was a young therapist. Um, we don't know what causes toe walking. There's a couple theories out there. One is sensory, is the child up on their toes because they need more input. And, and if we provide active, tailored, structured movement activities, does it help? Another one is motor. I mean, is the back of their legs, we call them their heel cords, are they tight? Do they need to be stretched? In that case, you might want to go to a physical therapist. Um, and, and then there's just idiopathic toe walking. So again, we, we don't really know. A thorough assessment is needed. I would go to either an OT or a physical therapist, an occupational or physical therapist, to get an assessment and a treatment plan. And for this thing, toe walking, you could, uh, I'm, I'm sure insurance would cover it if you could get a prescription uh, from your uh, pediatrician or physician for physical or occupational therapy. You don't even have to say anything about sensory integration. 